Hi, I'm Walter Kunin. I saw most of you yesterday. I'm happy to introduce our next speaker in this wonderful conference. Ed Hannenberg is a assistant professor in the Department of Theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati. He's also a theological consultant to the U.S. Bishops Subcommittee on the Lay Ministry, author of a book, Ministries, A Relational Approach. So we're very happy to welcome Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Walter, for the introduction, and thanks to Don Dietrich and the other um, organizers of this conference for their invitation to be here. I want to second um, Dean Hoagie's uh, commendation of the Church 21 Project. Uh, it's a good thing. We should be doing more of that. Um, when Don called me and invited me to speak about lay ministry at a conference on the priesthood, I thought that's a very good idea, that a conference on the priesthood in the 21st century is a great place to talk about lay ministry. And then I thought, in, in, in composing my paper, no, actually a conference on the priesthood in the 21st century would be misguided if it didn't talk about lay ministry, because I think that we've come to a point to realize that um, talking about the priesthood today can't happen in isolation anymore, and it needs to happen in dialogue with the many other ministries um, shaping our church today. Um, the pastoral impact of lay ministers and lay ministry in general on the role of the priest today is obvious, particularly to many of you who are pastors. I don't need to talk to you about the pastoral impact. You experience every day how the changing shape of a parish staff um, and ministry in the church today affects what you do in the parish and how we work in our ministry and mission. Um, I suppose if uh, what would be useful in talking about lay and ordained ministries would be to would be to offer some sort of advice on um, how to manage a big parish staff or, or, or offer some kinds of strategies for dealing with dysfunctional work environments, right? Not for your parishes, for other parishes <laughs> that have such adv advice for your friends that you could pass. But uh, that would be useful. But I'm not going to do that. This this talk will not be useful to you. Um, I <laughs> will not be, no concerns. Um, what I'd like to reflect on, rather than the pastoral impact of lay ministry on the priests, are the theological questions or the theological implications lay ministry has for our understanding of the priesthood in the church today. And maybe I could just begin with a story. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to team teach a course on ministry to the MDiv students at my alma mater, the University of Notre Dame. And Notre Dame is one of these happy places where most of the seminar where, where all the seminarians and the students preparing for lay ministry take pretty much all of their classes together. And so this class that we were teaching had almost an equal number of seminarians preparing for ordination and in entrance into the Congregation for the Holy Cross, and um, men and women who were studying for lay ministry. And Notre Dame's sort of atypical. The students tend to be seminarians tend to be younger. Um, at Notre Dame, the, the lay ministry students tend to be a good deal younger than their typical uh, lay ministers. Um, but this was a really good group of students. They were bright, they were energetic, they were very committed to the church, and they got along with one another, which made for uh, a, a kind of a healthy and a comfortable environment to talk about some of these issues. But even given all their friendships and sort of the, um, the, uh, the sort of comfortable and um, positive environment created by the instructors of the course, we noticed um, very shortly into the semester that there was a certain disconnect that is not so surprising um, between the students, the lay ministry students, and the seminarians. And it went something like this. All the topics that seem to be of most interest to the students, lay ministry students, the questions they continually asked had to do or sort of revolved around the issue of what it means to do ministry in the church. And so the, they're quite, they were concerned about uh, competency, they were concerned about the particular tasks, the roles they would play in parishes or different agencies and so on and so forth. They were concerned about their, the task of ministry in the church. The topics that interested the seminarians and the questions they continually asked revolved around the question of what it means to be a minister, what it means to be a priest the status of priesthood in the church today, their identity vis-a-vis um, -vis the community, and so on and so forth. So the lay ministry students tended to be inf interested in function, and the seminarians tended to be interested in um, identity or ontology. 
um, the, the, the being of the minister. And, uh, and we sort of pointed that out to the class, and, and they thought that was interesting. It generated some interesting discussion amongst the, uh, the groups. What interested me about that little experience, um, I, not so surprising, um, is that it, it, the way in which it was a kind of concrete example of what I'd sort of observed in the theological uh, literature on ministry over the last 30 or 40 years, that it seems in many ways you could almost divide this theological literature into two conversations. There's the conversation and the books and articles and church documents concerned about offering a theology of priesthood. That tends to be concerned about identity, ontology that's heavily Christological, so on and so forth. And then there's a whole other conversation going on um, that revolves around lay ministry or ministry more general. And that tends to be sort of more functional in a sense or interested in um, reflecting on the doing of ministry tends to be, rather than Christological, more pneumatological, emphasizing the charisms and in individuals that empower them based in baptism towards ministry in the church and so on and so forth. And there is certain places in which those conversations connect, but by and large, they, they sort of are going on um, independently of one another. I think that's changing, um, and I think, I think they need to come together. Um, and what I'd like to do today, um, in just sort of giving a brief summary of uh, the paper that was on the web, is point to a couple of things that get in the way of that coming together. Um, and I, I've sort of constructed this, um, um, I, I wanted to say three false dichotomies, but it's more three difficult distinctions, three distinctions that are made in our theology of ministry <laughs> that often, surprisingly often, are hardened into kind of false dichotomies that frustrate this coming together of theologies of priesthood and theologies of lay ministry. And those difficult distinctions are um, ministry versus apostolate, second, sacred versus secular, and third, the ordained priesthood versus the priesthood of the faithful. Right? And in my comments, you'll notice some overlap with some of the previous presenters, um, John Baldwin, Susan Wood. Um, and that's okay, because these are difficult. Uh, the reason they keep coming up is because they're problems, um, and they're important problems. And um, th th my approach will be to kind of see, to look at them more explicitly from the perspective of lay ministry. And then, so for each of these difficult distinctions, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the sort of simplistic application of that distinction and the problems it caused, causes. Maybe suggest only initially a kind of more helpful framework for approaching the question, and then um, ask in an only uh, initial way what that means for the ordained priesthood, the ordained priest. So it's kind of uh, understanding these properly in a way offers a kind of a challenge for understanding priesthood that I'll simply offer um, invitation for reflection. Okay. So the first um, distinction is the distinction between ministry and apostolate, which is something of a semantic issue, but there are kind of important claims to ownership of ministry in the church behind the debate over words. There are some voices in the church today who feel that all the troubles of the priesthood and ministry would be um, resolved if we just got our terms straight. <laughs> and the suggestion is made that, 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 the, that one of the problems is that this word ministry has been so broadly extended that it, it fails to mean anything and provide any real identity. Right? And, um, in many ways, the, 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 there's some kind of support to that critique. After all, um, you know, the documents of Vatican II never actually used the phrase lay ministry. Right? Of the over 200 times that that word ministry appears in the documents, only about 19 apply in some way to lay activity. Right? At the time of the council and throughout the council documents, there's a fairly consistent, not entirely consistent, distinction between the ministry of the ordained, which is what had the language that had been used, and then the apostolate of the laity. Apostolate is, was a kind of a vague term basically capturing the mission of the church. And in some ways, although not entirely consistently, that tends to be how things fall out in the council documents. You've got the ministry of the ordained and the apostolate of the laity. And so some today say, well, let's recover that. 
right? and talk about ministry of the ordained and something else of the laity. Right? The 1983 Revised Code of Canon Law further clarifies and um, becomes more consistent in its application of ministry language to the ordained of all its canons in only seven, on my count, um, does ministry, is ministry in some way extended to the laity, that term, ministry. Um, and it's careful to specify ministry as the exercise of the, the it, as belonging in, in a way to the ordained, okay? so that the laity are brought into that by the ordained, ministry, ministerium. Okay? And, we, you know, when it, and when it does use that, it's extraordinary. We you know that extraordinary mini, Eucharistic ministers or something like that, friends, and, and when the Code of Canon Law right, calls lay ministry extraordinary, it's not saying that they do it really, really well. Right? <laughs> um, they're, they're saying that it's outside of the ordinary. Okay? And, and the Code kind of clarifies that ambiguous language in Vatican II. The, uh, finally, the, 19, the famous, infamous 1997 instruction on certain questions regarding the collaboration of the non-ordained faithful in the sacred ministry of priests, document issued by eight Vatican offices, seems preoccupied with this question of terminology. After laying out some very general theological principles, the first practical provision they address is terminology. Right? And uh, re attempt to restrict the titles pastor, chaplain, coordinator, moderator to the laity. Right? Other confusing titles. Right? And although it doesn't say the laity cannot be called ministers or exercise ministry, it does make the claim that only in virtue of sacred ordination does the word ministry obtain that full univocal meaning that the tradition has assigned to it. So there's something of a battle over language there in an attempt to clarify roles in the church. I'm all for clarity in terminology, but um, I think with regard to the broader um, application of ministry language, the toothpaste is out of the tube, right? You can't put it back. You know, that, um, trying to ask people to stop using ministry in our context today in a broad and inclusive way is a bit like asking people not to use contractions. It ain't going to work. Um, <laughs> and so the, the, there's kind of a... Um, there's kind of a reality here that needs to be attended to, and sometimes the confusion or the debate about the language hides the reality, right? Words should follow reality. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that language ministry emerged, really, in a new way in the 70s and the 80s was to describe a new reality. And that didn't come out of anywhere, but that was inspired by social, cultural changes, and also the broader themes of Vatican II, right? The invitation... Um, for all of the baptized to participate directly in the mission of Christ and in the church, its emphasis on baptism, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so that's where we are. Um, we, this reality of a broader ministry, it was a way in which um, Catholics claimed a certain participation in the mission and ministry of the church. What does that mean, or what's the sort of challenge then for understanding ordained ministry if we can't rely on the sort of easy distinction between the ordained ministry and the apostle of the laity, it forces the ordained to reflect on what it means to be a minister among many ministers, right? Which is um, nothing sort of profound in that, but it's the, that is the profound shift in reflecting theologically on the priesthood since Vatican II. Before the council, priesthood was the prime category and the difficult category to figure out was the laity, how to incorporate them into the ministry of the ordained, right? It's been shifted. Ministry, I think, is largely the main category now, and priesthood is kind of the problematic or ordained ministry is the difficult subset within that. Right? So that, what does it mean to be a minister among ministries? And just one sort of example of that um, that I kind of ref invite reflection on in the paper is uh, what does it mean to be, to be a minister of the word in a um, world of many ministers? Vatican II um, recovered... Uh, the absolute centrality and priority of the ministry of the word. It's been addressed already in this conference, identifying preaching the word of God as the first task of the priest, the ordained, and of the bishop, too. But in many parishes today, um, most of the ministry of the word is done by other people. Right? When you think about sacramental preparation, religious education, Bible studies, faith formation, and so on and so forth, most of it is done by others. Um, and so how do you talk about the ministry of the priest? One option would be to locate identity in what is unique to the priest and somehow build a theology of the word around the homily or something like that. 
That's one option, but I tend to think of that as the sort of theology of leftovers, that you uh, build your theology of priesthood around what um, only priests can do. Right? Another approach, I think, or this it invites us in the direction of reflecting on how the ministry of the word of the presbyter or the priest is comprehensive but not exclusive. Okay. And um, that, I think, is uh, the direction of sort of reflection. Requiring the need to become a kind of a minister of the word today, the need to listen to the church past, in terms of knowing the tradition, but also to lis listen to the church present in the voices of, of faith today, and the need to let others speak. Right? Uh, the need to let others speak. That allowing um, uh, lay preaching in certain contexts is not a sort of a threat to the um, ministry of the word of the ordained, but is in fact a profound exercise of that ministry for the word that, um, that nobody owns. Right? That, um, so the need to let others speak. Just some initial reflections on that first distinction. Um, the second distinction, conscious of time here, um, is that distinction between the sacred and the secular. Another too quick application of this legitimate distinction tends to separate the world into the, the world of ministry and church into the sacred ministry of the ordained and the secular role of the layperson, right? And it's built around statements in the council documents, preeminently the beginning of, of, um, of chapter 4 of Lumen Gentium, Lumen Gentium 31, which states that to be secular is the special characteristic of the laity. It is the special vocation of the laity to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and directing them according to God's will. Now, what, what, how do we understand that or how do we approach that? How do we understand the statement that Vatican II makes about the laity as secular, having a particular secular orientation in relationship to the ordained, in relationship to their ministry in the church? Well, first of all, I think we need to appreciate that article in the context of the Vatican II debates. What did they mean by that? If you go back and, and read the discussion that was occurring at the time, when this text on the secular nature of the laity was presented to the um, Assembly of Bishops at Vatican II in order for them to debate and vote on it, Cardinal John Wright, who was the relator, or the, uh, the one who was introducing it to the bishops, explained the reasoning or the mentality behind the commission that drafted the text. And in that statement, he said, here we are not proposing an ontological definition of the laity, but a typological description. So in other words, we're not trying to define the very being of the lay person. We're offering a description of a type. And as Joseph Kamanchek, uh, uh, his exegesis of that text is that what they were saying is we sort of look around and see what laity typically do. The laity are typically married, typically raise a family, typically work in the world, and so on and so forth. And so in this text, we're offering a kind of description of that. So that's one thing, just in terms of sort of controlling exalted claims about the laity's secular nature. We'd want to be careful about using that to identify the laity in a kind of a contrastive way, playing sec sacred off of secular. There's also a kind of a larger issue at play in the process of Vatican II, that there seems to be a growing appreciation over the course of the Council for the way in which, and Susan Wood alluded to this last yesterday, to the way in which it's not just the laity who have a role to play in the world, but the whole church. Right? And Rick Gallardi points out nicely that there's an interesting shift in the way in which the metaphor of leaven in the world is used at Vatican II. In the early drafts and documents that led to Lumen Gentium 31, or the decree on the apostle of the layperson, that metaphor leaven is applied exclusively to the laity. Right, that the laity are the leaven in the word. But the, by the time you get to the final document of the council, it's the whole church um, that, as Gaudium et Spes 40 says, it's the whole church that is to be a leaven, and as it were, the soul of human society and its renewal by Christ and transformation into the family of God. So, again, just to sort of complicate that distinction between the sacred and the secular, right, that it... Um, and, and the text, too, you know, that they, they admit, the council admits that sometimes priests hold secular jobs. And also, by the way, there are, are ministries in the church um, uh, that are open to laity. So that raises um, some questions, and it also raises sort of the challenge. If, if we really do kind of follow through on the council in, a, in recognizing that the whole church 
exists in the world and has a mission t t within the world, right, to transform all of creation in the light of Christ, what does it mean then to be a priest in the world? Um, and I suggest in the paper maybe one direction for conversation or way to think about that is the way in which Gaudium et Spes approaches that question of the church in the world, right? Um, recognizing that the church wants to address all of humanity, Gaudium et Spes tries to find a common language to have that kind of dialogue, and they find it in the human person. So maybe one way to think about what it means to be a minister, to be a priest in the world, is to think about um, what are the ways in which the minister uh, serves to make the human community more fully human, which is the language of Gaudium et Spes 40. Right? What does it mean to offer a life in a ministry that heals and elevates the dignity of the human person, that works to draw people more closely together, that strives to give daily life deeper meaning? What does it mean to be for the human as one way to reflect on the, um, the role of being a minister in the world? John Sabrino, the Latin American liberation theologian, calls this the pro-existential meaning of priestly ministry. Right? Nothing other than expressing concretely and historically God's good coming, right? God's approach to humanity, right? an, a, an approach and a coming that occurs wherever people are. Um, and th again, here's a, here I veer towards the practical of it, so I, I don't listen to me much here, right? Because I don't know much about the practical. But, but what, what in one way is to, to talk about um, the priest as drawing on, working in collaboration with the lay minister as, a, as, a, um, as an asset, as a witness, right? The lay ecclesial minister working in the parish, not because they're secular, right? But because they're ecclesial, right? That they offer an example of, right, the church living and ministering in the world, um, pointing to that broader reality of the church in the world. Okay, second, third distinction is that, um, <clears throat> raised earlier between the ordained priesthood and the priesthood of the faithful. Right? And here the, the way in which the relationship, okay, so we've got some attempting to draw the distinctions between lay and ordained ministry based on language, the language of ministry versus apostolate. Other times it emerges in, in important documents and among theologians to draw distinctions based on the secular nature of the lay person as a kind of a framework. There's also the, the, probably the most common way in which the, the distinction is drawn is to appeal to Lumen Gentium 10, right? And to talk about how the ordained priesthood and the, min, and the priesthood of the faithful differ essentially, and not only in degree. Which serves so often as the kind of ace in the hole, right? And I'm amazed how many times I read that in uh, anywhere. Okay. Statements of, of church leaders, theologians, and so on, who offer that as an explanation for the difference in relationship between lay and ordained ministries, and then it's not explained, right? as if it were perfectly self-evident what it means to differ essentially and not only in degree. Two comments on this. Um, it's a valid, it's a legitimate distinction, right? I agree 100% I agree with um, Lumen Gentium 10, though they differ essentially and not only in degree, the common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood are nonetheless interrelated. Each in its own way shares in the one priesthood of Christ. True statement. But it becomes problematic when it is imagined as two groups of priests, the clergy priests and the lay priests, set sort of side by side. I don't think that's what Lumen Gentium is talking, 10 is talking about. Right? First of all, and I just have two comments on this. First of all, the, the text describes the priesthood of all the faithful, not the priesthood of the laity. Okay. The priesthood of all the faithful includes everyone in the church, laity and clergy. Okay, so immediately we recognize that it can't be lay priests alongside clergy priests because the priesthood of all the faithful includes everyone. And the, the story of, at Vatican II of Lumen Gentium 10 is interesting. Probably the most famous editorial change at the council was in the decree on the, or the, the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium. Earlier drafts of that document um, moved from the mystery of the church to the hierarchy to the people of God or the laity. And the suggestion was made, well, let's put that stuff on the people of God in a separate chapter, chapter 2, to make the point that the church is, first of all, the whole people of God. And after you talk about the whole people of God, then you can move to a chapter 3 on 
the hierarchy, and a chapter four on the laity, and so on and so forth. Early drafts included this treatment of the priesthood of the faithful in the, ch ch in the chapter on the laity, which structurally gave the impression that it's peculiar to the laity. But when that editorial change was made, they moved the material on the priesthood of all the faithful to the chapter on the pe people of God, which made more clearly the comment that we're talking about the whole people of God and that the ordained priesthood is to be seen in light of the priesthood of the faithful, in light of the priest, ultimately, of the one priesthood of Christ. Okay, so it's the priesthood of all the faithful, not the priesthood of the laity. But it's amazing how many times you see people talking about the priesthood of the laity. Right? And I silently give myself permission not to listen to anything else they have to say because they miss the kind of point of that, the distinction. The other comment I'd make on that is <clears throat> when Lumen Gentium 10, it's talking about the essential difference of the ordained priesthood, not of the ordained priest. The essential difference of the ordained priesthood, not of the ordained priest. And if you read the document in all that it has to say about the priesthood of the faithful, what it starts to describe are those spiritual sacrifices of daily life. John Baldwin talked about this nicely, right? The reception of the sacraments, prayer and thanksgiving, the witness of a holy life, self-denial and also active charity. When it's talking about the priesthood of all the faithful, it's talking about discipleship, really. And then when it goes on to talk about the priesthood of the ordained, it starts to describe those particular actions that serve the priesthood of the faithful, such as forming and guiding the people, bringing about Eucharistic sacrifice and offering it in the name of all, so on and so forth. It's no longer talking about discipleship, but it's talking about a particular ministry meant to serve that discipleship. So you can ask, well, are the priesthood of the faithful and the priesthood of the ordained um, essentially different? Of course they're essentially different. They're talking about two different things, discipleship and a particular ministry. Right? So I think that that helps us avoid this kind of dividing into two groups. It also raises the kind of challenge or the invitation for, for reflection or whatever you'd want to call it um, of what it means to be a priest within and for the priestly people of God. And one direction you can take this in, in sort of reflecting on this uh, um, following John Baldwin's um, uh, suggestion that we exercise the priesthood of the faithful by uh, through our, our participation or living in imitation of the priesthood of Christ, right? which was not some singular cultic event, a sacrifice, uh, uh, um, in, in a kind of a, a history of religions approach, right? But what Christ, according to the New Testament, Christ's sacrifice was the whole of his life, right? Lived as a sort of self-offering gift and so on and so forth. So what does it mean to live out of the priesthood of the faithful? Well, to live in imitation of that, to be Christ-like. But in order to do that, we need help. Um, uh, we need to be reminded of Christ's priesthood. And that's how I see the priesthood of the ordained serving the priesthood of the faithful, that, it, that, that Right? The, the common priesthood, the priesthood of all the faithful, needs to be brought to mind to that, Christ, that priesthood of Christ. And that's one way, I think, of recovering the language of in persona Christi Capitus, uh, rooting it in that anamnesis of the liturgical <laughs> prayer, right? that what's being done then there is not that the priest is reminding the community of Christ. Way too much pressure to remind the community of Christ. You're helping the community remember Christ. Is the distinction? Right? Mark, Mark Twain, right? What did he say? That the, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is no small thing, right? Tis the difference between the lightning bug and the lightning. Right? We don't remind, we don't, the priest does not remind the community of Christ, but helps the community to remember Christ. Right? That's what the Eucharistic uh, ana anamnesis is in many ways about. Um, so very, a very brief summary of some of the observations I made in my um, paper. Three ways in which, in a, three ways of making distinctions that have a surprising hold that I think are more complicated than they first appear. Um, I'd say by way of conclusion, um, you know, I teach this introductory course on the church at, at Xavier now and um, I sometimes begin by asking the students, most of whom are Catholic, what's essential to Catholicism or what is essential to being Catholic? And they shoot back a familiar litany, right? The, well, following the Pope and belief in transubstantiation and Mary, the saints, 
Um, and they sort of, so I sort of pushed them. What, what about the law of love? Right? What about commitment to Jesus Christ? What about a recognition of God's saving presence in the world? And they say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But those things aren't essential right, to Catholicism. <laughs> I think sometimes we make a, a similar mistake that, that we confuse what is essential to a thing with what is distinctive about it. And a lot of theologies of lay ministry and theologies of ordained ministry are, are obsessed, obsessed with the specific difference, right? Trying to seek identity by way of contrast. Um, and so you get these dichotomies, ministry versus apostolate, sacred versus secular, ordained priesthood versus priesthood of the faithful, and we forget right, that the first term in all of those pairs falls within the context of the second. Right? Ministry exists within in order to serve the mission of the church's apostolate. The sacred permeates the secular. Right? The ordained priesthood exists within and for the priesthood of the faithful. Um, and in terms of, I don't know, building a constructive theology of the priesthood, why let go of all the, those great, the great charge to sort of preach to the world and steward the tradition, to serve the full humanity of other people, to remind the priestly people of the priesthood of Christ? Why let go of those as essential features of the priestly ministry just because they are also exercised in a certain way by others? Um, so um, uh, let me just end there, and then maybe we can have some time for conversation or um, questions. Thank you. That's okay.